Okay, this is a, the first question is for Dr. Ginrich. So is surgery resection for a single tumor on the lungs, which is reoccurring, is still a goal? Is it still possible to do that surgery um, at that stage? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, in patients that have limited recurrence of their cancer, usually if it's located in one or two spots, at least there's a low burden of, of disease that's spread. Surgery is sometimes an option. Um, and it's definitely something that we would talk with our patients about, and it's something that would be a good idea to talk with your health care providers about. Uh, it depends a little bit on where the lesions are and um, how safe the surgery would be to do in that situation. But in limited amount of um, cancer spread, it's definitely an option. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, this is another question for Dr. Ginrich. I was diagnosed with chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, and during research I came across information relating to Berthog de Bay syndrome in my type of KC. Is it worth pursuing this connection with my oncologist as it relates to hereditary effects for my children? Uh, that's, that's another great question. Um, there are a number of different types of hereditary kidney cancer syndromes that have been uh, described. Bird-Hawk Bay is one of those types. Um, it would, it's definitely something that if you have questions, you should talk with your healthcare providers about. And depending on the situation, um, sometimes further testing can be done, and specific strategies can be put in place to help sort of minimize the risk. Uh, with loved ones, but that's something that first I think you should discuss with your healthcare provider. And on a personal note, whoever wrote that question, if they'd like to speak to me after, that's exactly my scenario, so I'd happy, happily share my experience with that uh, same question. Okay, this is a question for Dr. Uh, Zawiski. Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. <laughs> a general question given current um, drug funding. And um, how are clinical trials funded in Canada? And so, looking at the, you know, the challenge around funding structures, and then how to, how to, uh, how are clinical trials funded? Sorry, I'm just. <laughs> uh, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, so obviously, you know, everybody uh, looks at the cost, and the drug companies have to not trials. So uh, obviously it's easier if we have uh, a phase three study when the other drug or compared it to the standard, we always, uh, the company presumes that we'll get the funding before the standard will occur. Um, having said that, that inadvertently may lead to problems for patients, and the biggest example for that is Pazopanem. Pazopanem has been here in Canada in the what we call comparison study where we compared it head to head to Sunitinib. And we still don't have results from that. Unfortunately, we have a, a fallback as far as the drug funding is concerned, because at least in Ontario, the Ministry of Health only funds a reliance for the exposure to sunitinib, and would not budge to fund positive. And we are finding about this now when we have those patients needing further treatment. So um, in Canada, you have to be very careful. Uh, obviously, we want to do research, but. Um, we don't want to have patients at the same time in terms of lack of access to further treatment options. So it's a very, very difficult uh, thing for us to do. Thank you. So here's another question for you as well. Um, and the question is, I'm on Taizozanibib. Sorry, I can't pronounce these words very well. Thank you. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> kind of open-ended. I read about it. <laughs> Uh, one of those uh, more potent uh, VEGF uh, inhibitors. It's probably at a level of sodium in terms of activity has less side effects. The good thing about it, the dosing is continuous, just like with Pazopanib. I think the dose is one and a half milligrams per day. The drug has been developed mostly in Eastern Europe, and actually has been in the in the pivotal trial has been com compared to Sorapid because um, this DNA HIV would not allow us to compare the drugs to placebo anymore. And sure enough, the drug has shown a good PFS, I think, in the vicinity of around 12 or even over 12 months. So I think this drug is definitely uh, a good one. 
and I hope it will be licensed here soon. And uh, what I would suggest, if anybody's interested in doing so, the minute the drug is approval anywhere in the world, if the FDA licenses it, and the Health Canada, um, the Health Canada may consider individual requests, and you could look into the company who manufactures the drug to look for a special access program. The same, actually, if you talk about this, the same goes for acetonib. So be open about this. Ask for the drug by its name and challenge your health providers to look for the drug because there's some ways to get all those agents, fortunately. Yes, thank you. Here's a question um, maybe Laura could respond to, and there may be somebody uh, here in Ontario that, that's familiar with this request. What support services are available to cancer patients and or families to help them deal with the emotional and psychological aspects of the disease, and how do you access them? I'll go ahead and, and start from our clinical practice. We've got a social worker that is very much part of our team, and so she will meet with the patients as well as a nutritionist. And those are the resources available for us. We have our Cancer Answers team that are nurses who communicate and work with patients and their community physicians, as well as the Kidney Cancer Association. So what you've got here in Canada is the KCC. And I think in all honesty, that is the best thing. And then talk to your oncology team and find out what resources at that particular community or institution are available to help you because patients, families, children need that ongoing support. It doesn't matter if those children are 7, 10, or in their 30s and don't live close. Um, so getting that information out to everybody and, and the web is a wonderful way to do it. Dale, could you respond to that? Because sure. Dale's very uh, well versed in this. Hi, I'm the membership director for Kidney Cancer Canada, but I, when I was diagnosed in 2004, one of the centers that I went to for support was Wellspring, and there is a center downtown Toronto, Peel, London, um, but if you just go on there, actually they, they are here today, and so up in the foyer, there is a, a table with information about Wellspring. There's also downtown Toronto, there's Gilda's Club. They have a wealth of support information there. So both of those centers offer things from exercise, spiritual consultation, um, assistance for um, family members, children of all ages, and um, exercise programs, nutrition. So they're a really, really uh, great source of information and assistance. I hope that helps. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question for the entire panel. Um, is thyroid toxicity caused by sutinid permanent if sutinid is stopped? And then why isn't interleukin-2 widely used in Canada like the US? I'll take um, a bit on both questions and number one, Hydrocyanol-2 is not necessarily used widely in the U.S. We're really selective about the patients for whom are appropriate to Hydrocyanol-2. Um, clear cell, good comorbidities, or other health-related issues, and only at centers that are expert in, in doing it. And so I think it is used widely in a select group of patients. I would say the majority of our patients are on uh, one of the other therapies, or they're not on interleukin-2, one of the key things, if you're going to get interleukin-2, you've got to get it first. Again, the advantage of clinical trials, demonstrating how we should sequentially use these therapies for the most benefit and the least risk. So, um, our experience with the hypothyroidism, whatever thyroid, um, whatever treatment you're on, if you develop it or you have it as a pre-existing condition, it can be chronic, it can improve once you finish your initial therapy, but again, subsequent therapies may also have some degree of hypothyroidism, so it needs to be monitored because kidney cancer is a chronic disease. You may have this as a chronic condition, but it's one that's very easy to monitor and manage. I uh, just wanted to talk about the IL-2 in Ontario. So 
for the same reason as it's a rare indication, so we haven't really developed a center of expertise in Ontario. But for the longest time, we were lacking on courtesy of uh, Crossbow Park Memorial Center in Buffalo, and our patients were very treated there. But unfortunately, we uh, suffered a setback from the Ontario government last fall because the funding was not granted for that indication anymore, quoting the lack of very strong data. So they quoted us that we don't have a phase three data, we don't have survival advantage. So unfortunately, this has come to a close, and we are really distressed by it because once in a while we still have a patient from the county. I don't know what's the solution for this. Uh, we probably may have to do it locally, but in the meantime, funding is going to have to come from somewhere. But it's a very sad situation, at least in Ontario. Yeah, I actually um, would just agree with what, what both panel members have said. Um, from the hypothyroid standpoint, I have had some patients where they have gotten better after we've gone off the treatment and they don't have to keep going with their thyroid replacement. But I've had other patients that have, it's been a lifelong issue. So it can go either way, I think. And with the high dose and moving to, again, uh, it, is, it is a potential option in, in a select group of patients and, and it does have some benefit as we've seen this morning in select group of patients but, but there are uh, very few centers across Canada that, that have experience with what we're doing with I should say and as has been mentioned funding is an issue with that. Thank you. Sort of since we've touched on the U.S. Canada um, difference in terms of particular treatments I, I thought this was an interesting question. Are the outcomes better in the U.S.? I had to ask it. <laughs> Does anyone want to comment on that? I don't know that they're any different in the U.S. than they are here in Canada. I really don't think that there is a geographical difference. I think it just really depends on having being treated both surgically and medically by someone who has knowledge and experience in kidney cancer and ongoing communication make sure that you have the best opportunity to benefit from whatever therapy it is that you have available to you. I think we're going to have to um, look at data to answer this question and uh, I know that you're going to see a database in I don't know how representative it is. Is that mostly for Medicare and Medicaid patients? Predominantly. In Canada there is actually a collaborative effort uh, between the cancer Kidney Cancer Canada and university, uh, university centers to develop the kidney, kidney cancer registry. I think once that happens, we're going to have much better view and knowledge what our outcomes of treatment are. I think before that, it's going to have to answer that question. Okay, I, I have one more question I think I'll bring forward. Um, how can somebody get into a clinical trial and is it offered to every patient? Answer that. Um, absolutely, everybody is welcome. Um, I think it starts with the type of the trial. Like you have to see at what um, stage of treatment the uh, uh, patient is uh, at the present time. What line of treatment would he fit in? So always uh, look for the website's uh, trial names and look at the enrollment criteria. So first of all, there's enrollment criteria which describes the type of the patient required. Um, their um, health and other features, and there is exclusion criteria, which unfortunately excludes often patients with brain metastasis or severe heart conditions and so forth. So I think the easiest way is to get, this is a very relevant information. Uh, the NCI website is an excellent one, has a link to, there is a search engine there for all the trials. The European uh, Cancer Association also has one. In Canada there is uh, several of those. There is uh, www.kidneycancertrials.ca that has the database. And actually, our very own Kidney Cancer Canada has an excellent link to a very good study. So I encourage anybody interested to look at those, look at the criteria first and see if you fit, and then talk to your uh, care provider and see if that uh, can be done. Thank you. And I think I have um, time for one more. So um, this is a side effect uh, question. Uh, is a uh, pneumononitis from mTOR permanent? If one mTOR causes this, does that make that other mTORs are off limits for treatment? Excellent question. No, our experience is that the pneumonitis, if it should occur, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, is reversible. It may, if it is severe, require discontinuation. 
of that particular mTOR therapy. In the case of severe pneumonitis in our clinical practice, we would be hesitant to treat a patient with the other mTOR inhibitor. But again, you're going to get variances in clinical practice. Now, does that mean if an individual had severe pneumonitis three years ago, has been on subsequent therapies, would we, if needed, revisit a, the other mTOR inhibitor? Possibly. There are specific guidelines how to adjust for the toxicity. So anytime we hit the rate of toxicity, you have to hold a treatment and open to the spirit. So as long as you're careful and you don't push to grade three, I think you're gonna be well. For those who reach grade three and definitely grade four, I think the treatment should be discontinued and there's still other options to consider. Fantastic questions, thank you.